Good evening. Thank you for joining us for the Phil and Penny Knight Campus for Accelerating Scientific Impacts fifth installment of Science Night Out. I'm Bob Goldberg, Vice President and Executive Director of the Knight Campus, and I want to welcome you to this evening's Community Science le Lecture with Dr. Leslie Lev on the nature of nurture. Tonight's event is a continuing celebration of the completion of the first phase of the Knight Campus construction and the incredible vision made possible by the generous gift of Phil and Penny Knight a vision that continues to grow and become reality through strategic partnerships, world-class research, exciting innovation, and the support of the university and really all of you, our entire community. I hope many of you were able to join us in early December for the Knight Campus's virtual grand opening celebration. We are eagerly antici anticipating the day that we can all get together in the new building. But in the meantime, we're so pleased to engage with you through a series of virtual events, such as tonight's uh, event. As one example, the Knight Campus hosts a quarterly entrepreneurship speaker series, with our next speaker being on April 27th, Dr. Carolyn Bertazzi, professor of chemistry at Stanford University, and a member of the National Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Medicine, and National Academy of Inventors. She'll give a talk on therapeutic opportunities in glycoscience, and more information on these and other events can be found on the Knight Campus website. Now, before introducing our speaker this evening, I'd like to hit a few highlights from this past, let's just say, very uniquely challenging year. Despite the pandemic and wildfires, the Knight Campus has forged ahead with great speed and continually adjusted to make great st strides along our mission of science advancing society. A prime example of how we've turned challenges into strengths is the Knight Campus's role in providing space for a COVID testing lab as part of U of O's COVID-19 monitoring and assessment program. This lab is capable of scaling up to testing 20,000 samples a day and really illustrates how the Knight Campus can quickly adapt to support new and varied needs and assist the campus's mission of developing new interventions and novel approaches to unforese unforeseen health challenges. Now, a big accomplishment this year was the Knight Campus launched U of O's first engineering degree program very proud of all the staff's hard work to make this happen, which is a, a joint doctoral offering in bioengineering with Oregon State University. Within six weeks of the program receiving approval, we had more than 70 applicants from around the world, including many top caliber students. These students were so accomplished that several have already been selected for prestigious university fellowships. The Knight Campus Graduate Internship Program is also continuing its great success. 50% of the students who started that program in 2020 are women and or members of other underrepresented communities in STEM. And that's just one product of the program's dedication to inclusion and diversity, as well as student success. I'm extremely proud of this master's graduate program, which has a 98% graduation rate and 90% of those students have jobs in their field of study within three months of graduating. At the undergraduate level, we are in our third year of creating opportunities for undergraduates who are interested in careers in translational science. The Knight Campus Undergraduate Scholars Program will have its largest cohort to date this year with 12 students funded through philanthropic support. In addition, I'm very excited to announce that the Knight Campus will be offering a bioengineering minor for undergraduate students pursuing science degrees in biology, chemistry, physics, and human physiology starting this fall. We are also partnering outside of the U of O within our community and just launched a new program with Peace Health that will fund postdoctoral fellows from underrepresented groups in STEM, giving them the opportunity to work on collaborative projects between Peace Health clinicians and UO scientists and bioengineers. Now, in addition to growing our primary faculty who are housed in the Knight Campus building, which we expect to reach 12 by this fall, the Knight Campus has really benefited from a group of UO faculty who have their homes in other academic units on campus, and we identify them as the Knight Campus Faculty Fellows. We are very, very fortunate tonight to hear from one of the Knight Campus Faculty Fellows, Professor Leslie Lev. Leslie Lev is the alumni faculty professor in the College of Education. She's a double duck, receiving her master's and doctorate at the University of Oregon in the College of Arts and Sciences, and then returning to the university in 2013 as a professor in the College of Education. Professor Lev is best known for her research on child and adolescent development, gene environment interplay, and interventions for children and families. 
This includes preventative intervention studies with youth in foster care and with adolescents in the juvenile justice system aimed at preventing risky behaviors and improving public health outcomes. She's also engaged in adoption studies that examine the interplay between biological, uh, psychological, and social influences on development. She co-directs a, a NIDA Center of Excellence called Center on Parenting and Opioids. Her work also focuses on outcome, outcomes for girls and women. To date, she has published an extremely impressive 150 scientific articles and 20 book chapters and her research has been funded by grants from the National Institutes of Health and the U.S. Department of Education. Professor Lev has a great passion for mentorship, and she serves as a research advisor to numerous students pursuing doctoral, master's, and bachelor's degrees. She serves as the associate director for the Prevention Science Institute here at U of O and past president of the Society for, for Prevention Research. And if that's not enough, in addition to her faculty role, Professor Lev is also Associate Vice President for Research in the Office of the Vice President for Research and Innovation. But tonight, she'll wear her research hat, and as we uh, welcome her as this year's Science Night Out lecturer, and very much look forward to hearing about her research and the impact it's having on children and families. So Leslie, thank you so much for sharing your work with us this evening. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for that really welcoming introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be here tonight and to share some of the work we're doing on the nature of nurture here at University of Oregon with, with you all. So 10,258, 10,258, that is the number of adolescents age 15 to 19 who died in 2019. That is a, a tragic number, it's tragic not only because of those lives lost, and of course, because of the impact, the tragedies for those families, communities, friends of the lost loved one, but also the loss to our society, right? Adolescents are really the future, the promise, the hope of our society. They are on the verge of entering young adulthood, becoming strong contributing members to our society, to our workforce, our future leaders, our innovators, are individuals making impact in society. And to lose 10,000 of them or more every year is truly tragic. But that is really just the tip of the iceberg. There are 4.2 million adolescents, 400, 200,000 million teenagers visit the emergency room every year due to an accident. Not due to a physical health reason, not, in, not nothing related to their physical health, but actually to an accident, 4.2 million. So why is this happening? This is truly a tragedy. We're losing 10,000 or more adolescents every year and 4.2 million more are visiting the emergency room for injuries, injuries that may be preventable. Well, to answer that question, we asked some faculty and colleagues and staff in the Knight campus and surrounding areas about the leading causes of death in youth age 15 to 19. We wish we could do that in person with you tonight, but uh, the Zoom format is uh, preventing that. So instead we asked our campus community, and I'll give you all a second if you're watching now to think about what your answer might be about the leading cause of death in youth age 15 to 19. And here is what our campus community and our surrounding community responded with. They responded with answers like suicide, drowning, a gun shooting, drug overdose, domestic violence, and other related behaviors. And what you'll notice from these behaviors is a real theme, right? These are all behaviors. You don't see anything on this list that's a physical health condition. You don't see cancer, you don't see diabetes, you don't see asthma or other cardiac problems. You see things that are behaviors that may be modifiable or preventable, and I hope to talk to you a little bit about that tonight. Now, what you'll also see is that our community members who made these guesses were actually pretty savvy because the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, surveys the leading causes of death in the United States. And when they were looking at youth age 15 to 19, they came up with their data show three main causes. Number one, accidents number two, suicide, and number three, assault. And we think of these three outcomes, very similar to those that you all get, that our campus community guessed, 
as a construct, a cluster of behaviors we think of as behavioral health or behavioral health problems because they're behaviors. It's things like our mental health states, depression, anxiety. Uh, it's things like aggression or impulsivity that relate to these underlying causes of death. And I'm going to use that term behavioral health or behavioral health problems throughout this presentation when I talk about the behaviors and the context that adolescents and youth are living in today. So what I also hope to talk to you about, though, is a, a story about nature and nurture. And what I mean by that, when I think about nature, what we're talking about is things under the skin, our genes, our DNA, our biology. And when I'm talking about nurture, I'm talking about our communities, our families, our homes, our home environments. So these are all things that are, uh, we, what you notice here is this, this slide says the nature of nurture, and that is the title of this talk, because we have moved well beyond nature versus nurture. We know now definitively that the two work together. It's not a matter of one versus the other. It's understanding how they work together, and that's what I hope to tell you a little bit about in today's presentation, and in particular, uh, about how my journey into learning about nature and nurture began right here in the 90s when I was a graduate student at the University of Oregon. So when I was a university, I came to the University of Oregon because of the, the research excellence in the area of behavioral health and also some of the expertise in developmental psychology and the study of gender differences and boys and girls. Uh, and I was particularly drawn and influenced by two, two main research events as a graduate student in psychology. One was I became involved in a study led by a professor at the time, Hill Goldsmith, doing a twin study to look at genetic influences on children's social behavior or their behavioral health. And the second was becoming familiar with research happening at Oregon Social Learning Center, a research center here in Eugene, that was doing really innovative in intervention and prevention practices with youth at risk for delinquency or youth involved in the juvenile justice system. And it was through those two experiences as a graduate student that really started my, my pathway to exploring the nature of nurture. So I'm gonna start this sort of, I think of chapter one of my career, uh, on the nurture side, kind of the family community, the intervention prevention side of things, and my experience of learning about the interventions happening in the, in the, at the Oregon Social Learning Center, working with delinquent youth, and in particular, the treatment foster care Oregon model. So the treatment foster care Oregon model, it was started by Patty Chamberlain at Oregon Social Learning Center, and her did this design, it's really a comprehensive alternative to placing youth in group care, which was the traditional services as usual for the youth who, de who were delinquent. And the cornerstone of this really are a uh, focus on providing supports to families and parents to support an adolescent and help them learn the appropriate social skills to help provide parents with appropriate parenting skills so that the youth can thrive and survive and prevent re-entry into the juvenile justice system. And this intervention uh, has four cornerstone parts. The first one is parenting groups. So parents, uh, foster parents, youth are placed individually in a foster home as opposed to in an institutional groups care setting with other delinquent youth. And in the foster home, the foster parents attend foster parent groups about once a week with other foster parents and co-led by uh, professionals, one of whom is often a foster parent themselves, who talk to the parents about some of the challenges they're having. They teach them uh, effective communication skills, effective discipline skills, limit setting, supervision, and general problem solving skills with their adolescent. And not only is, is this, this is in addition to a discussion, there are role plays. So parents, foster parents have the opportunity to practice uh, effective strategies for working with their adolescent in the context of this intervention. So that's component one and really a cornerstone of the treatment foster care Oregon model. Component two is directly focused on the youth, so working with them one-on-one, -on -one, uh, often in a community setting where they're paired with another young adult and get to practice and learn and see appropriate social skills and social interactions, which they may not have been raised with or exposed to earlier in their childhood and adolescence. Component three, we think of as crisis management, so the ability for parents to, to pick up the phone and call someone from the program if, they're, if they have a question about what to do in the moment. They don't know, maybe their child refused to go to school or didn't come back from school, 
what do you do? And if you're not sure what to do, there's someone to pick up the phone and call and get advice on, as well as uh, a way to provide respite care for foster parents who just need a little bit of a break uh, from caring from the adolescent. And the fourth component is family or individual therapy, and that is in part for the biological or the aftercare parents, because just as important as it is to help the adolescent and foster parents thrive and survive, it's equally important to provide the biological family or aftercare family with similar kinds of supports around their own behaviors, their own mental health and life context, as well as parenting, because of course, the goal is for the adolescents to reunify with their home and be, be living with their family of origin following treatment. So this intervention itself typically lasts around six months. Uh, and we've been really fortunate, I was really fortunate to learn about this as a graduate student, this aspect of nurture, uh, and just became, it really sort of prompted my interest in learning more about preventive interventions for youth at risk for becoming involved in the juvenile justice system. Now, this model, Treatment Foster Care Oregon, it was first used, I will tell you about a study where it was used with a sample of boys in the juvenile justice system, and it was used with a randomized control trial design. And so that design, as you may be familiar with from medical studies, is essentially the equivalent of flipping a coin or rolling a die. So here in this slide, you see the, a, a picture of a die. So you may have heard about this from medical studies. So for example, uh, when a person, maybe they're trying out a new cancer drug, or maybe it's in the current context, a new treatment for COVID. Often what the medical profession does is they'll try out a new treatment or drug that they know from preliminary studies is very likely to be as effective or more effective than the usual service, usual treatment. And randomly assign, or with the flip of a coin, roll of a die, assign some individuals to receive that new novel treatment and others to receive the usual treatment as usual. Well, that same kind of design, that same randomized clinical trial design can be used in the field of behavioral health, right? You can try out a new intervention that you think is gonna be effective for a certain kind of behavioral health problems and compare that to the, treat the services as usual through the flip of a coin through random, random assignment. And the benefits of that really are that when you have this kind of design where individuals aren't choosing their treatment, and where you, you can control for things like events that happen in history. So, you know, again, in today's context, when you think of major events like COVID that are likely to affect people's behavioral health, uh, this kind of design allows us to control for those effects and not have them confound or bias the results and give us stronger conclusions about whether this new kind of experimental uh, program for behavioral health works as well or better than the services as usual. So that design was used with a sample of boys in the juvenile justice system using the treatment foster care Oregon model, uh, again, through the Oregon Social Learning Center under the leadership of Patty Chamberlain. And on the next slide, I will show you what they found. They found that they were able to cut a rest race in half using this innovative treatment foster care Oregon model. So what you see in this slide here is a rest went from about two and a half, 2.6 in the year following treatment exit for those in the treatment foster care Oregon group versus almost five and a half, 5.4 for those in the group care services as usual condition. So that's really phenomenal, a reduction of more than half through the, the treatment approach. Now, that just really grabbed my attention as a graduate student. I was super excited and, and enthralled by this. I wanted to, to join the research team. So I was fortunate to have a postdoc position at Oregon Social Learning Center following my PhD in developmental psychology at University of Oregon. And I was particularly interested in girls, right? That's what I had been focused on in my uh, graduate studies. And my thinking was really driven in part by what was happening in society at that time, because also around this time, now in the kind of late 90s, early 2000s, what we were seeing in, in society at large was a change, a shift in the demographics of who was involved in the juvenile justice system. Because prior to this time, it had been really vast majority of boys or people who identify as male. So maybe 
10 to 15 percent of the population was girls or people who identify as female in the juvenile justice system and the remaining 90, 90, 90 to 85 percent were boys. But around the late 90s, early 2000s, that changed and it doubled or tripled in terms of the number of young women, girls, folks who identify as women in the, in the juvenile justice system. So instead of rates of 10 to 15 percent, we were seeing rates of around 25 to 30 percent of the population in juvenile justice being composed of, of young women and girls. So that was really um, you know, just fascinating to me. I wanted to explore further whether these same kinds of interventions, the treatment foster care Oregon model that Patty Chamberlain developed, whether that would work as well or maybe even better for girls in the juvenile justice system as they had shown that it worked for boys. So in my postdoc at Oregon Social Learning Center, uh, we, start, we started a study of juvenile justice focused on girls who had been involved in the juvenile justice system. Now, we were fortunate to be able to recruit a sample of 166 girls, primarily in Lane County. All of them had been referred for out-of-home care by the juvenile just court systems because of their serious and chronic delinquency. And what I mean by that, uh, as you can see on this slide here, they had an average of about 12 criminal offenses or 12 arrests at the time they entered the study. So this wasn't sort of a um, you know, one-time shoplifting incident or tr teen truancy. These were chronic and serious um, situ contexts where they had been involved in repeat crimes and offenses throughout their adolescence. So just like the boys study, we were able to use this randomized control design and randomly assign uh, this sample of 166 girls into either the treatment foster care Oregon model or to group care services as usual. You know, thankfully, we were very grateful to our funders that made not only that initial study possible, but a set of follow-up studies possible so that we could look at outcomes not only during treatment or shortly after, but really up into the early, early 20s. Uh, most of the girls were around age 15 at the start of the study, and this funding enabled us to follow them into their early to mid-20s. Uh, Okay, so what did we find with the girls? And what you'll see on this side, very good news, we saw a similar pattern of results for just looking at arrests. So what we saw in the, in the group care condition was in that three year period following the start of the study, they had close to four, a little under four arrests on average per girl, uh, but the treatment foster care girls only had a little under two, so 1.8 arrests per youth in that in that three year period following arrest. So we're happy to see that the same types of programs work for, as well for girls as they had for boys. Uh, but we further looked at this um, because we were interested in kind of a cost to society. So we looked specifically at the amount of time they were spending in juvenile detention, also in that follow up period, in this case, the two years that followed the treatment foster care Oregon uh, program. And what we saw here, what you see in this slide here, if you look at the orange bar, the, the girls in the group care condition had many, many more days in detention in that two year period than those in the treatment foster care Oregon condition. And if you cost this out, you can really start to get a sense of the benefits to society to taxpayer dollars, because we know that here in Oregon at this time and currently, it would cost more than $300 per day for every day that a youth is uh, detained in the juvenile detention facility. And so if you multiply out that difference, what you see here is that, you know, just for one youth, you have a savings of more than $25,000 per youth uh, by, by delivering, by receiving the Treatment Foster Care Oregon program as opposed to the group care condition. And that's just looking at cost and detention, of course. There's other related costs uh, that could affect uh, taxpayer savings as well. So that was really exciting, very good news for us overall. Um, and we started to think more broadly about this kind of cluster of behavioral health, remember that I talked about early on, right? So it's, although the intervention itself was focused a lot on teaching parenting skills around preventing delinquency, there's this cluster of behavioral health problems that coincide together. And we were really curious to look at those outcomes. So we continued this research. Uh, and look specifically at three other areas, right? Depression, drug use, and teen pregnancy. And what we found for all three of those 
were really similar positive results. So for example, uh, I'll start with depression. We found that in that two year period that followed the intervention, the girls in the treatment foster care Oregon showed a reduction, uh, showed about half as much d depressive symptoms as those in the group care condition. For uh, things like drug use, we were able to look all the way into young adulthood, you know, into their young 20s and found similarly declines. So when by the time they reached that young adulthood, early to mid 20s, those in the treatment foster care Oregon group had about one third less substance use, less drug use than those in the group care condition. And then finally on pregnancies in that two year period, so really going out to age 17 eight to 18 or so, and looking at future teen pregnancies after youth entered the programs, we saw that the youth in the Treatment Foster Care Oregon program had about half as many teen, future teen pregnancies as those in the group care condition. So about a quarter of the uh, Treatment Foster Care Oregon had a new pregnancy, whereas about half of the group care uh, youth had a new pregnancy. So this was pretty stunning to us and also just reinforced this idea that these these behaviors, this behavioral health is really a cluster, right? They all kind of, um, these behaviors go together and you can deliver certain interventions aimed at the family and the youth, certain nature or nurture interventions uh, that affect this cluster of behavioral health um, conditions. So, right, that made us think, okay, uh, but what next? We know that this intervention works. We know that it saves taxpayer dollars. We know that it not only works on delinquency, but on this cluster of behavioral health, but kind of what is it about it that makes it work, right? What, why, why are we seeing these results? So if you think back to that slide where I showed the Treatment Foster Care Oregon model, it's really multi-component, right? You've got parenting group, you've got youth focus, you've got the, so, the social support essentially, and then each of those have a range of foci around different kinds of parenting, um, you know, helping with supervision and structure, being positively, having positive enforcement and good communication focused on peers. Well, what was it that really made the intervention work? And I like to think of this in terms of ingredients, like what are the active ingredients? So if you think of a cake, so here you see a beautiful chocolate cake and you see the ingredients, right? You know that every cake is gonna have flour, it's gonna have sugar, it's gonna have eggs, butter, et cetera. But what is it about that combination that makes th these ingredients in this cake, you know, produce this chocolate cake as compared to a vanilla cake or a cake that doesn't taste as good as this cake? Well, this, you can think of the same thing for the intervention, right? What is it about this intervention that really produced these effects that we saw in this study um, as compared to lesser effects or effects on different outcomes? So to look at that, we did a next, a second, next set of analyses uh, to try to identify these key ingredients. And I wanna highlight three of those key ingredients. That first one is peers. So through likely the parent training components where we were encouraging well kind of structuring of the youth's live and more supervision as well as the components where we were working directly with the the girls one-on-one -on -one. those girls who ended up as associating or having fewer friends that were engaged in delinquent criminal uh, activities and those girls who had more pro-social or positive peer relationships with other youth that was a key ingredient that really helped uh, the intervention be effective and result in some of the effects I showed you. And then the second one is positive reinforcement. <laughs> so one of the key factors that parents learned in the parent training groups is positive reinforcement. So when your adolescent, when your youth is doing something good, acknowledge that, reward them, give them praise and encouragement, right? It's so easy for us as parents, as grandparents, aunts and uncles, to see the negative things and provide corrective actions at that time. But it is not just equally, it is more important to recognize the good things and give positive reinforcement, praise and encouragement when you see those positive things happening. And that was a key component of the intervention as well. And then our third uh, kind of key ingredient we think of is school engagement. So in this intervention, those youth who attended school regularly and who spent at least 30 minutes per day on reading and homework time showed the, the best outcomes, regardless of which group that they were in. So those are key ingredients or key mechanisms 
that may that drive this intervention that make that make it work. So, you know, with that, is that the end of the story? Is that sort of check um, done? We solved it. We know we have an intervention. It works. It saves money. We know how it works. Uh, well, not so fast, right? I think what we started to realize when we drove a little deeper into the data is that this intervention, although it's so effective, did not work for everybody. It didn't work for everybody. Some of the girls actually got worse. Some, some showed no change at all. And even when you think of some of the outcomes I talked about, like teen pregnancy, having 25% of the youth have a, an additional teen pregnancy after the start of the study, which is the case for our, our treatment foster care girl condition, that's still not an outcome that we would necessarily think of as desirable, right? You want that rate to be much lower. So as much as we were celebrating the successes of this intervention, there's a but there. We, were not, we weren't done. What is it about it? We weren't fully successful. Some youth did not benefit as well as they could have from this intervention. And so what is it? What is it about the intervention or about us as people that why does it work for some but not for others? And so that really leads to kind of chapter two of my professional career at University of Oregon and thinking about individual differences and in particular our biology or our genes that might be reasons why some people benefit from nurture and certain kinds of nurture interventions, whereas others don't, or maybe, maybe they even have an, a negative effect, some kinds of nurturing interventions on some individuals. And so with that, I became involved in a longitudinal adoption study, which I'll tell you about in a moment, because that is one of the strongest ways to really disentangle, to really start to understand the nature side of nature and nurture. And how does, what role does nature play in our understanding of the effects of nurture or families or parenting? And so the adoption design is really, it's, it's one of the most novel designs because it's uniquely able to kind of separate or isolate the effects of what happens to a person before birth, whether that's from their genes or their prenatal environment. And then there's sort of this line with what happens after birth, which is what we think of as the nurture side of the equation, right? So in an adoption uh, study, when you have children who are placed at birth with with families to whom they, with parents and adoptive family to whom they are not biologically related, you have this clear separation between these kind of pre-birth and genetic factors and the post-birth and, and context that it, the youth is living in uh, as they are raised and grow up. And you can see that illustrated in these two slides. The child is really a product of both of these things, right? A product of their genes and their DNA and their prenatal environment from the birth parents and a product of their environment that they're raised in with their adoptive family, their community, their peers, their schools. And the adoption design is, is just a really novel approach to be able to separate this, but also to see how the two work together to influence child and adolescent development. So while I was a early career scientist at the University at, at Oregon Social Learning Center, we started a project called Oregon, the Early Growth and Development Study. And this was a, you know, it was kind of a large scale multidisciplinary project that involved folks who were expert in genetics, as well as folks who were experts in developmental psychology and child development. And some of the main partners were some colleagues of mine at George Washington University, Penn State University, Yale University, and University of California, Riverside, and University of Pittsburgh. And together we started a project called the Early Growth and Development Adoption Study. And here you see us. Um, this is pre-COVID, of course, uh, in one of our training meetings um, overlooking the Willamette River. So this was a, a training of our recruitment and assessment team for the new adolescent assessments that we were we, we launched about a year and a half ago. So this study itself, uh, we were able to recruit 561 adoptive families located throughout the United States. And there you see a map of where all of our adoptive and birth families were located. Uh, they you also can see the race and ethnicity of our families is primarily white, but also a significant number of children who were of multi, who were multi-ethnic or Latinx and black. 
And we were able to follow these families, both the adoptive families and the birth families starting in infancy, really shortly after the, the child was born, uh, and do things like home visits, go into their homes and uh, ask questions, do surveys, see the family interacting in their natural context, as well as some tasks that we uh, ask parents and children to do together. Now, one of the novelties of this design, too, is not only following the adoptive parents over time, but also the birth parents, because what the design allows us to do is look over time at how much the child resembles or is influenced by their adoptive family or what's happening in the adoptive home, right, the, the nurture side of the equation, as well as how much they resemble their birth families, their biological parents that they are not living with. And that's the nature side of the equation. And, you know, I also want to just, I think a lot of people, when you think of adoption or birth families, birth parents, some people have a stereotype of what that means. But our the birth families in this study and throughout the United States are really quite a diverse population, right? Ours ranged from teenagers all the way to their 40s, from college graduates to high school dropouts to those with really uh, successful careers and positive mental health to those who are really struggling. So there's a whole range of birth parents and the decision to place a child for adoption, you know, is, is a really a brave and bold decision. But this variation, these differences in our birth families, birth parents, enables us to really disentangle the variation in genes and genetics, the biology, the, the nature side, side of child development over time. So as I mentioned, we went into families' homes starting in infancy and all the way up now, our children are in their teenage years. And I'm going to show you and talk to you a little bit about uh, one of the tasks that we do in the home. So uh, for any of you who have a toddler or had a toddler at one point or are a grandparent to a toddler, you probably know that getting a child to clean up tasks, to clean up toys after they've been doing something fun like um, playing with their toys is not always the most fun job for a parent or for a child. So one of the things that we did when children were toddlers is we went into the homes, we had them do some fun activities together, and then we asked the parent to help, to ask the child to clean up the toys. And we gave them about three minutes to do that. And what you'll see in this clip I'm about to show you is, you know, children don't always want to clean up their toys. They'll find creative ways to, to get out of it. Uh, but we were particularly focused on a skill called structured guidance. So, and it kind of relates to some of the adolescent parenting skills we were talking about, about how do parents um, kind of supervise or structure their, the, their lives for their adolescent. Well, the same is true in toddlerhood and even more important. So how do, what kind of skills do parents have to help their child do the tasks at hand to put the toys back in the box uh, when maybe the child doesn't want to. And I'm going to give you an example. These are real families, real moms and kids um, who've agreed to have their, kindly agreed to have their videos shared today. So here's one clip. Wow. One. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. Hey, do you see all these blocks? Are you so excited? Yeah. Do you see all these blocks? Oh. Hey, we're not going to play with the shopping cart. Oh, yeah. A tiger. Can the tiger come help clean up the blocks? Okay, tiger, can you help us clean up the blocks? Can you help? Good work, tiger. Rawr. <laughs> wow, tiger, you've, you're cleaning up a yellow block. Oh, mommy's turn? Mia's turn. Can you clean up all these blocks? Tiger is such a good helper. Mia is such a good helper. Yeah, so what you saw there was a mother using structured guidance really effectively, right? The child didn't want to clean up the toys. <laughs> They were running for their, their shopping cart to do something else. And the mom restructured the task, right? Turn, turn the child's distraction into, oh, okay, let's see if you can use Tiger to help you clean up the tasks. And, and that drew the child back in, right? I can think of situations in my own life as a parent where 
that might have instead turned into chaos and the child would have run off. My, my son would have run off with the other toy or shaman cut and I would have sat there and put all the blocks away myself. Um, but that's not what you saw here, right? The mom turned that around, engaged the child, used structure and guidance to help the child complete the task that was being asked to, done to, to do to clean up the toys. So we were really interested in how that level, how that amount of structured guidance that parents do with their kids doing during cleanup, how that relates to children's behavior problems in other contexts. And so we looked at that with the data that we had. And what you see in this slide here is that overall there's that line goes slightly downhill, right? And so what that's telling us is that the more structured parenting that parents used, the fewer behavior problems children had in other contexts. So structured parenting is generally good, um, and that's why you see that, that slight line. But remember, now we had an adoption design, right? So we had additional data we could feed into these analyses. We had data on the birth parents, and we were able to divide our sample into two groups, children whose birth parents had more of these behavioral health problems. So they had more anxiety, depression, substance use, engagement in the criminal justice system. And then children whose birth parents, birth families did not have that history, right? They did not have a history of mental health problems, substance use, or delinquency. And then with those two groups, we were able to look at this again. What is the relationship of structured parenting for those groups? And in this first slide here, what you see is the group of children whose who did have the higher genetic risk, right? Whose birth parents had the higher mental health problems, behavioral health problems. And what you see there is that that effect of structured parenting is even stronger for this group, right? That line goes downhill. And so by the time you have moms who are using just a very, very high level of structured parenting, those children have fewer behavior problems than anybody else. They're way, they're way low on their behavior problems. In contrast, the start of that line for, for children where their mother is not using much structured guidance at all, those children are having uh, much higher behavior problems in other contexts. And that's why you see that slope of the line. But what happens when we look at the other group, our group of children without the genetic risk? And so here in this slide, you see that pattern. It is the exact opposite pattern, right? You see that line going up. So in this case, if for children who do not have that genetic risk, having that really high level of structure from their parents actually is related to more behavior problems for them. They don't need that guidance. That's kind of over controlling and intrusive for them in terms of their future behavior problems. And for those children, those lower levels, letting the child adapt to the task naturally is more effective in reducing behavior problems in other contexts. So that was really fascinating to us and just something that you, if you didn't have this kind of adoption design, you wouldn't know. And you'd be making perhaps wrong or at least different conclusions about the guidance you might give parents in terms of their own parenting with their child without this information. So we are also curious about other behaviors. So the next slide I'm going to show you is a video clip of positive reinforcement. You remember positive reinforcement was one of those key ingredients in our intervention, our, our key nurture ingredients. So positive reinforcement is different than structured guidance. And I'm going to show you an example from another family here. Uh, and again, this is a, a real family videotaped this over Zoom for us. So um, excuse the quality, but I think the audio will be, you'll be able to hear good examples of positive reinforcement in this clip. Yep, put them right inside there. Good job, that's it. And he picked that puzzle up and put it inside. Wow, good job. Oh my goodness, you're getting faster. Good job. What a cleaner. <laughs> Good job, Luna. Wow, put it all in the bin. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Thank you for helping me clean up. So there, what you saw is, you know, the mom wasn't trying to structure or guide the child as to what to do. She was really giving a high level of positive reinforcement. A lot of good jobs. I'm so proud of you. That's what we think of as positive reinforcement in the context of this type of task with a young toddler. So what did we see with this task? 
And if you look at the results here, we saw a really different pattern, right? The positive reinforcement was effective for all children, regardless of their level of genetic risk. Just like our nurture intervention studies showed, right? It works for everybody. It's a key ingredient. It doesn't matter if the child comes to the project, comes to the context without uh, a history or with a history of genetic risk. So it's a, it's, it's a behavior we want to encourage in, in all parents. So that sort of brings me to the kind of chapter three in my, my story here, which is bringing it all together, right? How do we put together these pieces, this knowledge that we learn about nature with what we've learned about nurture and what are the next steps in that regard? And so I wanna tell you for a minute about a, a, a new project that we're doing that we were so fortunate. This is in collaboration with Dr. Maria Schwer Collins, who's one of our first graduates of our prevention science doctoral program. And she and I are co-leading a project that where we're able to follow up those original girls that were involved in the juvenile justice system all the way into their 30s with um, just thankful for funding from the Department of Justice for this work. And so as you might remember, those, that's in that study, those adolescents entered our study in their teenage years, typically around age 15. They then were in the multi, the, the treatment foster care Oregon intervention or in group care services as usual. And then we had some follow-up outcomes in later adolescence and early, young, early adulthood. And now with this funding, we're able to follow them all the way into their 30s, you know, nearly 15, 20 years later in some cases, and look at the biologic, the, this kind of interface or the interaction with biology and intervention. So some of the things that we'll be doing for this project, which is just starting, is collect blood spots, blood samples, to look at some of the biological markers of health. So for example, your immune functioning, your cardiovascular health, and really get a more in-depth look at not only sort of does this intervention have long-term, does this nurture intervention have long-term impacts on health in adulthood, but does it have health impacts that are under the skin that are part of our biological makeup, right? And we, we do know from research that has studied trauma and other events that those kinds of, those things in our environment are around us, the nurture parts of our life, those can get under our skin and they can affect us at a biological level. And this study will really help us disentangle and really closely examine the under the skin aspects of some of our nurture interventions or our exposures in our environment to trauma or other life stressors. And do they have sustained long-term consequences for our health? And do positive interventions like Treatment Foster Care Oregon or other positive events that happened in these young women's lives, do they help remedy some of the negative effects that could have happened because of their earlier childhood adversities? So really excited about that project and continuing it going forward. And I will leave you with a final future direction that kind of integrates our understanding of biology or nature with nurture, and that is a center on parenting and opioids. So together with researchers at Oregon Health and Science University and the colleagues at Prevention Science Institute and Center on Translational Neuroscience at University of Oregon, we're really lucky to have a center of excellence focused on the center, uh, focused on parenting and opioids. And I think, as everybody knows, we're, we are in the middle of the COVID pandemic, but we are also in the middle of an opioid epidemic. And those two things combined together have made the lives for some families so challenging. If you think about families of young children, particularly those age zero to five, who may have a history of opioid use or other substance use, and now you layer on top of that that they may not have access to schools or daycare or their jobs may be terminated may not be able to visit their jobs and now they're in may not be able to access their treatment services so with this center we're able to do three research projects so our oregon uh, health and science colleagues are really looking at families where the mother may have a history of opioid use and looking at how that might affect her brain development and how it might affect the brain development of her young baby, her infant growing up. How do those two things work together? And then a second project led by Phil Fisher in Center on Translational Neuroscience, looking at 
okay, well, let's measure those sort of the, the biology and physiology, but let's layer on a video coaching intervention and see if we can change underlying biology through a video coaching intervention. And then third, a study led by Beth Stormshack at Prevention Science Institute doing outreach to rural families who may have experience with opioids or other substance use. And what we know, again, in this COVID pandemic, rural families are particularly hard hit, right? They don't have good access to services. They're very isolated. Uh, and when you compound that with employment challenges and a substance use history, it can be really challenging for these parents. So we're really fortunate that her intervention will be outreaching to rural populations in Oregon and using, you know, taking some of the exact parenting strategies you learned about, the nurture strategies, such as positive reinforcement and converting them to a telehealth model that families can watch these and learn from these interventions on their phone without having to navigate a whole system or meet face to face and then do some of the services by telephone. So I'm gonna leave you with a, a clip from that intervention. It, it'll show a bear family um, and there's a whole series of clips. I'm just gonna show you the one focused on positive reinforcement. And uh, here it is. It shows that encouraging and praising your child is one of the most effective ways to improve their behavior. There are many ways to use encouragement and praise. When you pair praise with physical touch, such as a hug or pat on the back, your impact can be even stronger. In this everyday example, watch how dad notices his daughter's positive behavior and gives her specific praise. Thanks for putting your bowl in the sink. You're being very responsible. I'm a big girl, Daddy. You sure are. High five. You can be encouraging without using words, too. Catch your kids behaving in the ways you want them to as often as you can. You will be surprised how much your positive reactions can improve how the whole family gets along. So that was a really nice example of positive reinforcement that, that paralleled some of what you saw in the adoption study. And I hope that on that note, I, I, I really wanna thank all of my colleagues and collaborators and our funders and collaborating partners and institutions. And, but the biggest thank you honestly goes to those families, children, and communities who uh, participated in this research and made all of this possible. And with that, and on the theme of positive reinforcement, I will just say thank you for your kind attention. And I hope that you learned something about research at the University of Oregon and this complicated interface between nature and nurture. Thank you. And with that, I will take a seat and we can turn to discussion. Thanks, Leslie. Um, wow, that was an amazing uh, lecture. And I have to say, so fill, filled with hope for, for families that these interventions can have such an impact. Um, so, and I just want to thank you for giving your lecture out of your living room. This is not, of course, you know, how you, we normally give lectures. And so just imagine the, the, uh, loud applause from the from the audience right now that you would have had if you were this in person. Um, and I'd like to transition to some questions because we actually had some great questions submitted by uh, some of your colleagues. And I'll start with, you know, you mentioned COVID. Um, and of course, that's, you know, on everyone's minds right now. Um, and, I'm, you know, all its effects on mental health. As you look forward, you know, are there things that we've learned about COVID and how it's going to affect your future studies and behavioral health? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And one thing, you know, I actually meant to say this and forgot, but, you know, when I was talking about behavioral health and the causes of death, those data don't include the data from COVID. And when you look at it now, this past year, since April, March of 2020, the rates of youth suicide, the rates of youth overdose, have doubled, and so it's 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 partic particularly challenging time for everyone. But but adolescents, I think, are particularly vulnerable. 
So, you know, in terms of the practicality, some of the things that's affected for us as researchers is we used to, as you saw from those videos, we would go into people's homes and interview them face to face and, you know, engage them in tasks and activities. We can't do that right now. So we've switched to a model on the research side where we're using, um, uh, we're having them, <laughs> we're doing a lot by Zoom, which, I, you know, it's all too common and for everybody here, but also having them film their own interactions so that we can get the same kind of quality of data that we might get if they if we were able, you know, to be there face to face. So that's kind of just I guess a practical change in the research. And I mean I think on the the other practical side is thinking of these interventions such as the one that I spoke about about best like Best Storm Shack, is thinking about ways to, to reach out to families, to individuals, to communities who may not have as easy access to services because things are closed. Um, so using more telehealth interventions to be able to reach out to, to families over, to, um, over electronic methods as opposed to, to deliver treatments and therapies and prevention and approaches at, at, instead of coming face to face. Um, and then I guess I'll say one more thing, which is our adoption study. You know, we're part of, it's part of a national consortium now that has about 50,000 children in it. And one of the things we're particularly interested in is the effects of COVID on children because there is so little known about that. And it's estimated that one in 10 children likely had COVID. So seeking funding now for a future project that would really explore the, the long-term effects of COVID on child's health and development. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, we've learned so much during COVID and it's, I guess, sort of ironic that perhaps, you know, something that may come out of this is more effective delivery to more people um, uh, because we've learned some yeah. new tools, really. Um, yeah. My second question is really, uh, I was really fascinated by your last study and, um, you mentioned trauma and the changes in the biology and things like that following trauma that are noted. Um, and you're now doing this for the, the behavior uh, cohorts. I wonder, are you also thinking that this may, those markers that you measure in this study, could, are they also potentially predictive markers? In other words, could you go back earlier uh, when a child is yeah. having checkups and maybe use that data you're now collecting um, downstream as predictive biomarkers. Yeah, that that's an ideal future direction for me, Bob. You know, I think, you know, just because of history and where my own career has in this study that we're doing now with following up these young women, you know, we know their trauma histories. We know that they had this intervention and now they're in their 30s and we'll look at their biomarkers. But we'll, we can't make as strong as conclusions as we could if we'd had that data collected earlier in childhood, right? We don't can't make as many kind of causal conclusions about what came first. Um, but we do hope that we can, by using some of our correlational tools, look at the associations between trauma and the associations of positive life events. I think, you know, I I really I think of our research, even though there's so much sadness here, I also think of it as very promising and hopeful because so there's so many people have had so many bad things happen to them in their lives and yet they're they're functioning extremely well and so if we can understand more about these turning points um pos where positive things may have happened in their life or they had the right supports and how that might affect the biology under the skin as well yeah, your your hopeful message definitely came through in your lecture. So um, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. The, um, so the next question uh, from your colleagues was, you know, you, you you showed a lot with studying both girls and boys, and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about some of the differences and the type of interventions that work for each, and or the ways behavioral health outcomes are identified for females compared to males. Yeah. That's a really, that's an excellent question. You know, what we know from studies of youth who've been involved in the juvenile justice system is, you know, at the point when they're adolescents and entering the system, boys and girls look a little different. They have a different cluster or history of, of their, from 
their events from their childhood. So for example, typically girls, when they're entering the juvenile justice system, they've had much more trauma. Um, they've had an average of like one different caregiver or household placement per year through, through their childhood, which is, can have a tremendous impact. And they have more challenges with other co-occurring mental health problems than boys do. And so they're entering the juvenile justice system a little bit differently on average than one another. Uh, and then what we, I didn't get into detail on this in the presentation, but the intervention itself, we modified it. We added some components for girls that we knew to be more research related reasons why things might operate a little bit differently for girls. So there is such a focus on social relationships and relationship building and emotion regulation. We added some components to the girl intervention um, that were emphasized more heavily for girls than they were for boys. We also added some components around dating and risky sexual behavior uh, for the intervention with girls uh, that we did not have for boys. Um, but the other thing I would say is that when you look at the outcomes, and again, I didn't highlight this, but the outcomes are better for girls than they are for boys. If you look at the number of arrests in that follow-up period, girls are really improving, both from the treatment foster care Oregon model, but also from the group care intervention. So I think there's a lot of hope for these kinds of supportive relationship-based interventions for folks who identify as female or girls and young women. And what about the parenting side of the equation? You know, is there anything you're seeing in differences in the interventional yeah. strategies for moms versus dads or different family structures, um, co-parents versus parents, you know, that are separated? Right. Uh, another excellent question. There's so much we don't know about that. I think as a field, we've we've not been very good at studying fathers. Um, we do we know that fathers play a critical role in the development and behavioral health of their sons and daughters. Uh, and our adoption study, for example, has a has a strong focus on fathers, and we see that fathers' involvement uh, and positive parenting has a, a significant effect on child development above and beyond that of, of mothers. Um, the other thing we really find is that the, the relationship between the parents, right? The, whether it's a marriage or a, 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 a partner relationship, that is really essential um, as well for child development. So we, we, it's a gap in the field. We need to know a lot more about how moms and dads influence on child development or the, the nurture side might differ for boys and girls. But um, what we do know is that Dads are super important, and so is the relationship between mothers and fathers. So we need more funding in this field. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, the next question is, you know, what sort of recommendations would you give to parents or to service providers um, who are supporting youth that are struggling, you know, with their emotional well-being? Um, where they perhaps don't have, you know, some of the information you have on, you know, genetics, and their, their, their genetic disposition is really unknown. Yeah. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, there, there are so many families out there who, who do not know the genetic history of their child or so many individuals who don't know their own biological relatives, whether it's through adoption or other reasons, you may not have information about your genetics or your biological history. And so I think, you know, I think about this like in the medical field, it's kind of a similar model, right? When you when we go to a doctor, you're often asked about your your family history of whatever, cancer or other illnesses. Um, the same is, is a good idea for behavioral health, looking at the extended family and what their behavioral health uh, challenges and strengths may be to inform you. But that said, not everybody has that information. And I think it, I would just come back to this cornerstone of, again, just like in the medical field, you, you're not always going to have that. You're not going to know if someone in your family had cancer, for example. Um, and what's important, again, is it, it's, it's not genes versus environment. They work together and you take the information that you have and and that's what you work with. So here, you know, with kids, we know that positive reinforcement that's fantastic for everybody. It doesn't, the genetic background doesn't matter. 
Uh, and I think that can apply to a lot of beha behavioral health conditions. Your answer to that question uh, brings me back to your title again, which I love, the, you know, the nature of nurture, and it's not separate. And, and to me, what that says is a lot of uh, maybe the bias previously that they were separate had to be that everybody was working in their silos and different disciplines. And I think what's really impressive what you're doing now is you're bringing together different disciplines to tackle these problems. Could you just kind of talk about how the interdisciplinarity approach uh, has has impacted your research? Yeah. Uh, well, I love it. Honestly, I would be bored, I think, hanging out with a bunch of colleagues that were like me and only had my expertise. Um, because working with folks who are expert in genetics or immune markers, it just adds this and a whole nother perspective and allows your research and your findings to be so much more rich. Um, I'm thinking, for example, you know, just working recently with folks in the life sciences and biology at U of O around microbiome. Like that's, I don't know the science behind microbiome extremely well, but we've got experts right here at University of Oregon who do. And so we can study things like the gut microbiome and its effects on health in the context of our adoption design um, and really kind of disentangle some of these nature and nurture questions in ways that, that neither of us could do on our own, but we can put our, our science and our knowledge in our, our toolbox, our toolkit of, of research tools together um, and just learn so much more. It's, it's uh, I, I would be bored without the interdisciplinary science. It's one of the favorite parts of the job for me. Yeah, I know a lot of that microbiome research happens in zebrafish. Now, I'm not sure how you study the behavior of zebrafish. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you can help them with those studies as well. Yeah. I keep commenting on the fish tanks. Like, they're all, um, like, that's not zebrafish's natural environment. Where's the nurture? <laughs> so, I yeah. don't know. Maybe at some point we'll, we'll do a, a zebrafish nurture experiment. <laughs> Um, the next question, I guess, is uh, probably a pretty common one you get, but you know, you've had a, a great career in this space and, and probably had some results that were not what you expected. Um, so, you know, what's what's the result that was the biggest surprise for you uh, over your career? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that is an, that's an excellent question. And um, I can think of a couple different answers, but I think what I would say is you know, studying a population like I have of youth who've been involved in the juvenile justice system or youth who've been involved in the child welfare system. And when we receive data from these systems or from the individuals themselves and learn of the, you know, the tremendous trauma and adversity that so many young people have experienced, it, it, it you know, it's, it's heart wrenching. And at the same time, is surprising in a very positive way to, to know that, that many of them, despite this tremendous adversity, lead really successful lives as adolescents and young adults. And I, you know, as someone myself who was fortunate to not have that adversity, I think it, it just, it's remarkable to me. It just shows the resilience of humans. And, and of course, that's not the case for everybody. Some people really do struggle. And I, I don't say that to diminish the severity of some of these adverse early childhood experiences. But the fact that some individuals can really thrive and whether that's a function of their biology and or the combination of the their nurture and the context that they've been in, it just it does continue to surprise me that the the amazing resilience that we have as humans. Well, and we know that health problems run in families, uh, you know, whether they're yeah. diseases or, you know, mental health problems, et cetera. You know, what is, is your work sort of shedding light on why that is? And, and, and is that, I guess, revealing new intervention strategies? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I do think that's the beauty of the adoption design, right? So if you think of a behavioral health uh, problem, like say depression, and we know that depression runs in families, um, and then you try to translate that to interventions. Well, if you if you have 
biological families only, which is what m most of us as researchers study, you don't know whether that that similarity between parent and child is because of the prenatal environment from the mother to the child, if it's because of genetics that they share, or because if you have a parent who's depressed, the environment they're raising their child in is going to facilitate depression. And so you might deliver your interventions in the wrong place, right? What if we learn that, um, there, that there are just critical sensitive periods for depression during the pregnancy period, during the prenatal period? And if we could just intervene there, it would really kind of stop this intergenerational transmission of de depression. Well, the, the adoption design is, is, is designed just to, to do that, right? Because we can separate out by looking at the child in relation to their birth mother and birth father and their current, the fa their family, their adoptive family. And as our kids are now, they're just entering adolescence. So we, we really hope to be able to do some of that research going forward as we have data on them as teenagers and, and hopefully into young adulthood. Great. Well, you know, since this is Science Night Out, I have to ask this question. You're the night campus of, you know, science impacting society. You know, as you, as you think about your work, what do you what do you think the biggest impact has been or will be going forward? Mm -hmm. I really think, you know, kind of that concluding slide that I left you with, with taking some of our interventions uh, on the road remotely and using these telehealth models so we can have a much broader impact. I think um, giving access to so many more people, whether it's in Oregon, as we're doing now with that project, or nationwide or even globally, uh, being able to take the knowledge that we have from these interventions and convert it into online tools uh, that are cell phone or computer accessible it really has the potential to to change things to give people the access to services that they have not had not had access to before so that's probably the direction i would see as the greatest future for public health benefit and is that sort of as you look ahead 10 years is is that where you see this all going next oh well <laughs> i wish i could predict 10 years from now um I, I think the field of genetics and this integration of nature and nurture is, is just uh, developing so rapidly. Um, I'm hopeful that we'll learn a lot more about how to, how to provide families, individuals and families information about their family history risk from a, from a nature standpoint about behavioral health in just the same we, way we do right now for for physical health, um, because I think that that leap has not been made yet as a society, right? We do it for physical health conditions, but we haven't yet done it for for the behavioral health. And I think we're we're on the cusp in terms of the knowledge and technologies and science. And in ten years, I hope that we're there and we're able to to value and provide those supports and interventions that are informed by what we know about. Uh, nature and biology in the field of behavioral health, just as we do for physical health. Well, I think that's maybe a great way to, to end uh, this evening. Uh, I really want to thank you, Leslie. This was just uh, an amazing lecture, uh, a message, I think, of, of hope uh, for families and, and children and, um, and, and one of impact. And so just so appropriate for Science Night Out. Um, I also want to thank everybody who joined us uh, for this lecture and encourage you that if you have additional questions, uh, you can go onto our website and uh, submit those questions and get your responses from as soon as possible. Um, also encourage you to attend some of our other events on the night campus, which will be on the website. And hopefully, as I said, we'll be back in person and, and next year be doing this lecture uh, with everybody in person. So Leslie, thank you again, and thanks everybody for joining us.